What more could one ask? It's up to you to determine whether that was worth the trip or not. It was, it was. So uh, that aside, happy St. Patty's Day as we go with issue number one. And for that, Mr. Joe, Joey Torts for Reading. Well, we just came off a, a pretty robust discussion about local schools, so I'm going to try to keep it on the, in the same lane here this morning, Rob. And first of all, let me uh, welcome back Mike Height. We, we certainly missed you, Mike. Thank you, sir. Uh, the uh, legislature did pass out uh, a bill that we discussed briefly about a month ago, and that is the athlete transfer bill. It is now on the governor's desk and soon to be signed into law according to uh, all reports. And so what the law is going to allow is for any athlete in grades 9 through 12 to transfer one time without penalty and without any reason that needs to be given in terms of either academic or athletic pursuits. The, The transfer is allowed to occur, which is a different process than we used to have in West Virginia. So I'm wondering, this raises some some interesting questions. Uh, Number one, what do we think the impact is going to be on Eastern Panhandle athletics when we have, what, seven high schools, eight high schools within about a half-hour drive of just about anywhere in Berkeley and Jefferson County? Secondly, do we believe that parents and coaches – will still appreciate the fact that it will be SSAC r- rules that recruiting is improper and actually can be punished or sanctioned. And thirdly, do we think parents and students will appreciate that studies show that transfers do have a negative impact on academic performance of students? Will these factors be weighed? Will there be a great impact on our Eastern Panhandle athletics? And, Rob, since you are a a, a coach at a high school football level, and I know you work with Division I caliber athletes, I'll be interested in your viewpoint on this also. So those are my, uh, my thoughts this morning. Thank you, Joe. Let's start with the Admiral here. Yeah, I'm a... I'm not sure that we're looking at this from the student's perspective as much as we are the, from the fan's perspective. Uh, I, um, I see nothing wrong with unlimited transfers. Uh, let the students go to where they think they can get the best education or where they can get the best uh, opportunity to, uh, to play ball. A lot of the, some of these uh, gifted athletes uh, need to get the best coaching they can for them to move to the next level. Uh, why hold them back? Uh, I'm not sure the SAAC should uh, should have much of a say-so. I'm not sure the legislature should have much of a say-so. I say just let them transfer, let the dynamics play the way they should. Larry Schultz. Uh, uh, so that it's clear, we're not talking about a situation where a kid has to move into the Martinsburg uh, catchment area, the school district, in order to transfer. They can do that now. What we're talking about is a kid who lives in Hedgesville – uh, transferring to Spring Mills just because mom and dad will give them a ride over there. They're not going to run a special bus, I take it. Uh, they'll, they'll, give him a, they'll give him a ride over to school, and he can play football at, at Spring Mills. Are we also saying that same kid from Berkeley County could go to Jefferson or even Berkeley Springs? Mike Height, fresh uh, off the legislative session? So, so, yeah, I would think so. Um, but I'm going to push back on Bill a little bit. I, I don't know that... You know, Welcome back, Mike. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know that we should be allowing kids to just transfer, regardless, um, all the time, more than once. You say unlimited. Um, there, there's some of that is going on already, and there's. I have known kids. Um, that will transfer to one school to play football and then transfer back to the other school to play baseball. And J.R. House did that between West Virginia and Florida. Well, well 20, I'm talking about high school ago. here. So said, yeah, he did it in high school. So, but it, should it be allowed? I mean, these these sports are supposed to be representing a school, and the school is for an education. You're not there to to play ball or play sports. You're there to get an education. So if you're there just to to get uh, a scholarship or something like that, you, you're forgetting about the education part. So you should pick a school, go to it, 
you're allowed to transfer once with within the, the four years that you're there. So I don't have a problem with it being that way. But I think this law was – I think it was more a shot at, at the WVSSAC to rein them in and, and to them to say, listen, you don't get to make all the rules um, without any oversight at all. And I think that's Amen. what the legislature is trying to do is rein in the WVSSAC who make poor decisions all the time without any repercussions when and when you take them to court over something like that the courts are saying they're an independent body they make their own rules we have no authority here and i think the legislature is saying there have been enough lawsuits um with the wbssac there have been enough questions that there, there needs to be some legislation here uh i i expect more in the future not less to try to rein in the wbssac i would prefer to have the whole thing dissolved. I don't like the WVSSAC at all. Um, I, I think it should be uh, probably run in a different way, and, and we just need to get rid of those guys. Fist bump right there, big guy. I, I don't know where your campaign <laughs> contribution <laughs> treasury is, but I'm contributing to it. <laughs> Mr. Carl. Well, I, I, I kind of agree with, with both uh, Bill and Mike. Uh, That's good. You're we're becoming, on, but we're you're, opposite you're, the ends of the spectrum. Well, here, though, kind of, Mike. He, he <laughs> become very no, no, diplomatic. No, 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 he no, got diplomatic. No, 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 because, because <laughs> I, I don't think they were. You know, it was just a matter of unlimited transfers. That's your problem, Mike. And and uh, you know, there may be need for some some restraint, but freedom and the and the individual <clears throat> students' interests have to come first and the SSAC was undermining that and so I I, I recognize the appreciate the legislature's you know uh, pushing back and you know and tell them put them in line a little bit well Mike I, I'm glad you said student because that's what they are and I think we're getting the student part is getting lost in all of this yes, and yeah. we're talking about athletes transferring back and forth well, to, play, uh, uh, to play sports yeah. they're students part of part part of being a student is participating in in the sports for the activity, school you attend, activity. it doesn't have to be but, sports; it can be any club. But but but, or, but, 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 but there's still there's still are you know academic tests and grades and everything. So so they have to you know they have to. But that <coughs> excuse me, that should be managed on an individual level, uh, primarily. But yeah. my libertarian instincts, which I'm not a libertarian, but it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> my my libertarian instinct says, why get involved? To this level with the parents and the students. Well, there I could say the a, same thing. Be, Why is the WBSSA like, getting involved I, to this level I, with now, the students? And yeah, parents? I'm not sure. I would I would agree with your point. Getting rid of the SAC altogether and putting some other body. That's not really the issue. That was it. May have been the underlying unstated reason and, by the bill. And I think it's but, become about money and power for the WBSSA. It's not just about sports yeah, anymore. Yeah. They've they've imposed themselves into the robotics. Um, uh, competitions now that that they oversee that well what why don't the legislators just address the kernel of the problem and go toward the saac as opposed to doing this in a roundabout obtuse there way. are people within the legislature that like the wvssa they Take have them friends Take within them the w and we are <laughs> little bites baby little well, bites you know we just had an amendment did we not that was going to allow the legislature a much bigger role in a whole bunch of things involving the West Virginia schools, and that amendment failed. And so maybe they're they're yep. kind of stepping gently. <laughs> they don't want to go in there and all of a sudden find out that uh, the majority of West Virginians think the legislature has no business in this. Um, I'm not saying that's what I think, but uh, little steps. If, uh, when you begin, you don't start out running in this thing. You right. start out walking little tiny steps. And, and I think that's what's going on now. Well, I don't think at any point along the way, more than 1% of the kids out there in a busy year would be transferring anyway. Right. Okay? I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so this, this fear, and it's the same illogical fear that prevents locality pay from being passed which is, of course, the fear that somebody in Berkeley County making ten thousand dollars, you know, a more a year teaching is, is uh, putting one over on somebody from one of the southern end of the states where the cost of living is less. Right? You're not. Your house costs more. That's the end of the story here, and it's it's the same way here. Look, uh, as we all know, 
There is no rule. You, I, we've got, what, three lawyers in the room and on the phone. There's no rule that can't be bent by a good lawyer, right? That's why you guys exist, to find a way around the law that's there right now, right? So we already know that the best receiver from this school over here winds up on that team over there the next year. That's been going on for years. It just depends on who's really good right now. And that goes on in every county across this country probably, <clears throat> right? So if it's being done anyway, because you can find a way around it, then why do we put up this farce that it's, that it should, that it's illegal and that it's harmful to everybody when it's not? Because you have a, 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 a bureaucracy, a government bureaucracy that is controlling people's lives. And, and you don't. The WVSSAC is a private organization. Uh, it's not a government uh, organization. Oh, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's enabled by... It is enabled, but it's current, completely current private, law. which is why it always wins its court cases. Because, well, they're private. They make the rules, right? Well, well, but the, the law can be changed, and here is a step. And this is why we're doing here's it. Here's a step in the right direction. And I agree with and, it. And we should have passed that amendment because the State Board of Education would no longer be immune from some legislative oversight. This is not going to result in 50% of one school's population going to another school. Exactly. This isn't going to happen. I agree. So in a busy year, you might get a handful of kids who leave a particular school to go to another one for a particular activity or sport. That may happen. But in, but in general, that's not going to be the, the, the rule of the day. What percentage? There's only so many t spots that are open on a roster. And you you can't you can't characterize the SSAC as a private corporation like WRNR. It has a absolute control of public ed an aspect of public education. But the, but they are not a government entity. Is my they, point? They they operate as a government entity, which is even worse because they're not re they're Listen, not responsive to. to we're the on the same side here. You don't have to yell at me. We're on the same side. All right. right. I am not. If you think I'm a fan of the SSAC, you've never heard me before on this show. Uh, let me ask another question. It's, it's, a, it's a parasitic but, industry but that survives off of school kids. Let, let's leave a let's leave a bad system in place to so lawyers can get some income from fees. Yeah, well, that's ridiculous. Uh, Again, again, you're you're yes. not you're not hearing what I'm saying, Mike. You you all the thing you heard was you thought I was attacking lawyers, so you got your back up straight. That's all that happened there. No, you said you said you said leave it in place. No, I didn't. Well, no, it sounded to me like it did. That's because you got angry as soon as I said something about lawyers. <laughs> the, the, I started off the show with, right, with right, a compliment right. about your fee that you were charging, and then it went downhill. Let's, right. let's make a let's make a perspective. Uh, bring a perspective to this. How many kids in West Virginia get a lifetime benefit like free college from playing sports? A fraction of 1%. I mean, it may be the tiniest fraction. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some other state, Vermont, or some other place that has even fewer Division One A football recruits. Sure. But, I mean, we can count on one hand in the last five years, the number of, I mean, the whole time I've lived in the Eastern Panhandle, um, why can't I think of his name? He passed away. There was a West Virginia uh, kid from this area who ended up playing in the Super Bowl. Fulton Walker. Fulton Walker. Um, but I can't think of any others right off the top of my head. So we're all going to get all whipped up about this. And we do have some other problems with our education system. And we're not talking about a very large number of kids whose futures are going to be changed by this. Well, but but for the general public, that that's irrelevant that because this has become an industry. That little Johnny, from the time he's five years old, is being videotaped. He's he's on apps. They're keeping stats on him. The parents have gotten to this point where they're they're taking their kids and they're they're pushing them for these things. They're grooming them to get a scholarship and to play major league ball in some area. Um, and and that's just the nature of what's going on in America today. So they're the parents are just as guilty as anybody in this, where they get to a certain point, they get to that eighth grade, and a lot of times you, you have parents that are holding them back and having them do another eighth grade year, um, whether they they're passing or not, you know, so that they're bigger, stronger, faster by the time they enter into high school. 
and then they're picking the high school they go to based on who's got the best team, who's going to get the most – little Johnny's going to get the most exposure on this particular team, or – they don't have as much competition on this team for their particular position, so they'll get to shine more. There's all that going on, and, and I think that's what this legislation is trying to stop. Say, listen, you, you're supposed to be going to school to get an education. Go get your education and play ball at the school where you're getting your education. You can transfer once without penalty. Other than that, there's a penalty. You have to sit out a year. And, and it's just trying to rein in some of that. I, I, the only reason I bring it up is it also occurs to me that while it may be a fraction of 1% who end up getting a free college education from their high school sports, that's not true of high school academics. There are a lot of kids who get a free, high, free college education from their academic work. And, um, and so it, it's got to be more than a fraction of 1%. Uh, there were a couple in my in my family well let's say and it's they free to geniuses, them okay it's but... not free it's free to them okay oh, yeah. the, the rest of us are paying for it sure okay. just just like subsidies to business that take place all the time we we, we do that all the time we all pay for it and uh, they get the Somebody money pay. so it's not yeah. free it's free to them yeah, yeah and mike the my point was it's going on anyway this just legalizes it that was the point that i was trying to make okay. but by saying what i was saying that you can We've been just finding ways around it, whereas this just makes it legal, is all. Uh, Joe, it comes back to you for the last word. Yeah, and I think that's a, a salient point, Rob, is that it has been going on. Uh, my kids were in athletics, and, and I know for a fact that uh, kids were transferring. Uh, that you had to fill out paperwork and claim there was an academic reason for the transfer, and everybody kind of hemmed and hawed about that. And, and the paperwork went through, and and little Johnny and Susie was at the new school the next year. Uh, as long as the parents can can handle the, the transportation expenses of getting their kid to, uh, out of district into another school, it was happening a lot. And now, uh, rather than families moving to a condo or a mobile home to establish residence in another district, it's all, it's all legal now, one time. And I think this was inevitable. Uh, the momentum clearly across the country is school choice. And that school choice uh, is going to be for just more than academics, clearly. It's going to also involve athletics. So uh, I think the legislature was wise to put this into place. I think the legislature is wise to evaluate the SSAC's role, role in all of this because, because they do run amok and they win every court case because they get wide deference from our Supreme Court. And, uh, and, and remember, the SSAC is a creature – of the legislature it was established by the legislature to govern athletics so the legislature does have the power to cut back on them and i hope they'll do it more than just this piecemeal legislation uh dot com in studio with the admiral bill stubblefield delegate mike height attorney at law mike carl attorney at law larry schultz attorney at law joe ferretti via telephone and in the break in between <laughs> uh delegate mike hornby paid a visit to uh, scolds, scold, just, scold, just berated <laughs> Delegate Michael Heights. With like a big stick, <laughs> a shillelagh or something. But it, 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 I got the impression, though, that Mike Hornby was right. Mike Height had not read the bill. When Mr. Hornby <laughs> talks, he's always right. <laughs> well, it, in my defense, this was a, a Hornby bill. So he knew all the details about this bill. There's SSAC the, bill you're talking yes, about. Yes, right? the WSSA bill. And they now are considered a government Yes, entity. part of that bill puts them as a considered as, as a government entity, which gives the, the legislature some more authority over because they are a government energy. And in regards entity. to the classroom aides that we talked about with Melissa Power right. from the Board of Education, the first segment, Mike said that it is for one grade right now, pick the grade, K to three. It's not for all three grades. Correct. And they've appropriated an extra, I think he said, 39 or $49 million. Like 39 million, million. yes. $39 million for so, it. So. so there's plenty of money there for that. That uh, It's all on how they use it. As always. So, right. All right, on to issue number two for that, Bill Stubblefield. You know, it's always fun to follow Joe Ferretti. I'm convinced Joe could offer an issue how white is white, and there would be a very engaged discussion. So Very nice. Well Especially done. in Florida. That's right, yeah. Okay. Uh, my <laughs> well, it's always sunny there, Larry. Good tans. Okay. My issue is, is West Virginia Correctional Program 
in a crisis mode, a crisis situation. And let me get, provide some, uh, some statistics to it. Uh, eight of the correctional facilities in the state have vacancy rates of over 40%. The Vicki Douglas uh, Juvenile Center in Martinsburg, over one half of its positions are vacant. Since uh, July of last year, 375 uniform officers have started in corrections, but 359 resigned. There's an article in yesterday's, uh, one of the yesterday's news media that the administration is scrambling on an hourly basis to, to provide uh, uh, shifts. Uh, officers are working double shifts, either voluntarily or forced. The result is burnout at an alarming rate. The last August, the governor declared a state of emergency and dispatched members of the National Guard to help. Eight months later, 340 National Guard men and women are performing support duties. The legislators, I think, took very little action. They did provide $2,300 to the correction officers as they provided to all other state employees. A bill that would have increased salaries by $10,000 over three years, as well as providing a $6,000 hiring and retention bonus, died in the House. A Senate bill which would provide an additional $10,000 in locality pay all also failed to pass. These are expensive proposals, but the state is paying over $40 million a year in overtime to the, and to the National Guard, money which could be used to, to correct the problem. My question is, what was done? We have this problem. We were in a state of emergency, and my view is very little was done to to correct the, the the core problem, the structural part of the problem. There's one person uniquely qualified in the room to tackle this, and that would be Mr. Hunt. Well, after that intro, do we have time to discuss it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll, you're con you guys are confined to 10 man, seconds apiece. Man, oh, man. Mike, you came back loaded. <laughs> so to answer your question... Yes, we are in a crisis mode. That's evidenced by everything you just said, including that uh, the, the, the declaration of a state of emergency, the fact that we have National Guard in there right now, and that they have extended that state of emergency. Um, so without a doubt, yes, we're in crisis mode when it comes to corrections officers. Um, I, was, I was very disappointed that the legislature didn't do more to correct this. Um, I think that um, it was always uh, in their mind that they may be coming back for a special session to take up this issue um, specifically. Why are you saying they? It's we. Well, we. Sorry. Um, you know, on the well, outside, when wasn't I say in. Wasn't in his <laughs> when I say they, it's uh, trust me. Uh, leadership has a, a, a big role to play, and and how legislation goes, and and the way it it rolls through so um why didn't some of those things pass you you mentioned locality pay we are just not there with any type of locality pay right now um i think we are we are making ground in that area but there are some legislators that uh, they 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 call it panhandle pay down there they don't even call it locality pay so they are just adamant they will not vote for anything that says locality pay not even a study i mean that costs no money just a study to study the issue their answer is no i i have heard from some of them um that say you want locality pay give us back our severance you know we're, we're coal country and we're struggling down here and and you're going to take some of our severance for a county that produces no coal no gas no, no oil, nothing, and yet you take our severance. To me, which my response was, please take it back because yeah. it's a, a drop in the bucket compared to what our annual budget is. You can have it back. If that's the trade-off, if you want severance and I'm going to get your vote for locality pay, then I, I'm on board with that. So how we pull that, I think we're making inroads in that regard um, but we're still not there yet. So even with something as important as correctional officers, you weren't going to get that kind of legislation passed. I do think something needs to happen. Um, I will say when I say they, I think what they wanted to happen was for um, the, the tax break bill to pass and then 
to take that 750 once they they figured out what that number was it's around 750 million dollars now you take whatever's left and you say this is what we have left to fix these other issues so like like corrections and i think that is going to happen i am hoping that is what happens i am hoping that there's going to be a special session that we go in and focus or at least interims to go in and focus on the corrections problem and it's not just corrections either it's it's state police we still have an issue with there are there are cps workers there are still issues around the state that we have to get a handle on um and right now we're just not doing it so that's my hope uh, i think that's going to happen in the off season bill any comments about the brevity of heights answer <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was just impressed how Mike came loaded for bear this morning. It's as if he had not missed a beat for those two mu uh, too much. He was in I was hoping if I went long enough, there wouldn't be time for a bud. <laughs> that is the training of our legislature right there. <laughs> yes, Mr. Carl. Well, I, I'm very pleased that uh, Mr. Heights down there making these arguments and 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 i i i'm hopeful that he, he's right that the it's it, it's gonna locality pay and the need for that is going to start to become more and more apparent tell, tell 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 those people from logan county uh well what about all the income tax and sales tax we send to you buddy Oh, don't don't worry. You Mike. made that I, point. <laughs> I point that out to him. So every time I make a vote, that I say this did not help the panhandle at all. I want you to notice how I voted there. It did not help the panhandle at all. It only helped your county. So keep that in mind the next time EP pay comes up. And, and, and it's, but it's just one more example of the one size fits all men structure of the West Virginia in. in uh, in much of government, particularly education, that has held us back and puts us at the bottom of the list in terms of progress and growth and income. Mr. Schultz. Um, one of the things that interests me is obviously you don't have a lot of choices if you're down to using National Guardsmen to act as corrections officers. What are we going to do if there's a bunch of floods across the center of the state like there was back in 2016? I don't know what our staffing is in the National Guard, but are we are we literally going to pull these guys out of the jails and send them to a flood? I mean, I, I, I have no idea how this is going to be, and it is an emergency measure, and if for no other reason they need to fix it, because the last I checked, West Virginia, when it rains real hard, there's places where it floods awful bad. And that's our first line of defense is the National Guard coming in and organizing the emergency stuff to the extent that we have them in the jails. We can't pull them out. And so, yeah, this is a potential emergency that could get really big in this spring uh, when the right rainstorms hit, if they do. And let's hope they don't. Um, I, this is a kind of a scary thing. Of course, we do have child protective services, adult protective services, and a whole bunch of other things where even you you wouldn't ask National Guardsmen to serve as child protective services workers. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so we just don't have anybody for those things. Um, I, I don't know. They do need to probably have a special session and address all of these things. The raises that they provided is a step in the right direction but it's never going to suffice. Um, wages are going up everywhere. Um, you know, the, the, the convenience stores, some of them are paying 17 plus an hour. And, you know, that's a big change over the last two or three years. And obviously, you would think that making subs is a little bit less stressful than being a jail guard <laughs> or, or making decisions about the lives of children. Um, and you would expect that if you're doing that kind of work, you'd get more money than the guy making the subs. Um, we, we hope we can get there. There's a prison joke in there, and I'm not going to use it. Joe Ferretti, let's go to you. Well, I, I fear that the problem is bigger than just not having enough correctional officers. Uh, I think jail conditions, prison conditions across the state are uh, in great need of fixing. Uh, we don't have janitorial staff at appropriate levels. We don't have people who work with the infrastructure 
the electricians and, and those who make sure that the locks work on the doors in the jail. Uh, it, the problem is a lot bigger than, than what I think what we're discussing, and I fear that the legislature may have an understanding of this, may appreciate that there's going to be a lot more money that has to go into the system than just getting higher pay for correctional officers. There's a, a federal lawsuit pending in the southern part of West Virginia, a pretty big suit regarding jail conditions. So uh, this is a big problem, and um, I, I fear that, that – if this legislature goes into special session, they've got to tackle all aspects of this issue, not just getting more uniformed officers in our jails. Well, we we did when you you mentioned like the locks in the jails and stuff like that. There there was a supplemental appropriation, I think somewhere around the neighborhood of twenty million dollars, to to fix that situation. We we were made aware of that, um, and we, there was a supplemental appropriation to fix that. So there are certain things that they're taking care of um, when they can. I think uh, another issue with this is, is if you look at the unemployment rate in West Virginia, it, it's not very high. So it, it, a lot of this is we have more jobs than we have workers and the workers can pick and choose where they want to go. And a lot of times they're just not picking correctional officer or CPS worker or, or any of these types of jobs because they are more difficult and they don't pay as much. So why not just go work at Subway and make subs, which is a whole lot easier work for the same kind of pay. So I, I think what's going to happen is we end up paying more for CPS workers or correctional uh, officers and you get some more people. It's just going to pull them out of other locations and you're going to have shortages in other areas. It's just, where do you want to have the shortages? Do you want to have it at the sub shop or do you want to have it in your jails? And, and that's, that's the, the area where we need to have an influx of workers back into West Virginia. Um, and that would, I think that well, would help some. It's a nationwide problem, Mike. The uh, business report we ran earlier this week or late last week said that there are currently two jobs for every one unemployed person right now in America. Correct. Which means that there shouldn't be any un healthy unemployed people, basically, is what the Absolutely, and which is why the, our, our unemployment rate is so low. And we hear all the time about how the population in West Virginia is going down, but actually net migration is positive in West Virginia, which means there are more people coming into West Virginia than are leaving West Virginia. It's just our death rate is also higher than our birth rate. Because well, it's, it's an older, unhealthy and, state. And Correct. I can tell you as a resident, of Morgan County, a lot of those folks are moving here, and the, the last thing they want is a job. <laughs> They're retired, well, and they want to go live true. by the Cape and River and watch that clean water flow by. Some, but, some no, of that is true. You're, but, you're but, right. But the unemployment rate isn't based on people who are higher than the uh, employment level, right. or retirement level. Sure. Actually. But as we get more people in here, some of them are not going to be eligible. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the new, the new people. Yeah, right. Final thought goes back to Billy. Yeah, we can rationalize this a lot of different ways. The bottom line is we've been in a state of emergency for the last eight months, nine months, and I did not see meaningful legislation come out of the uh, this past session to address the problem. You did see $14 million, which was intended for the prison system, diverted to build a baseball field at Marshall University, however. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe the third base coach, instead of saying oh, stop, Rob, can do that in the... Rob, I stand yeah. corrected. I stand corrected. Is that <laughs> another accomplishment? Is that combined cover. with the SSAC thing? <laughs> Separate. <laughs> Separate entity. Yeah, because they get those kids from out of state. I can right. tell you that the legislation <laughs> was just as PO'd about that as everybody else. <laughs> Joe, go back to your, your conspiracy theory on that one, because it got quiet, oh, didn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, it's all been all quiet uh, with the Senate committee that first looked into that. And my theory still holds that that was uh, a judo move just to get the governor on board with the tax plan. All right, issue number three, we go to Mike Heights for that one. Delegate? All right, mine's pretty simple, and it is, did West Virginia improve during this legislative session? Well, let's simple start. Simple and to the point. Let's start first with what I anticipate to be the most critical voice in the room, Larry Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> in some ways, it did. Uh, but in some ways it didn't. Now, what's the balance there? We have a long ways to go, I believe. Some of the issues we were just talking about. So did West Virginia get a little bit closer to, uh, let's say, break even? Um, 
Maybe. I think maybe that we can say that. But we have a long ways to go. And at the current pace of improvement, it's going to take years. we got to pick up the pace of, of improvement. And if that means that the budget uh, needs to be restructured or rearranged in some way, uh, or even that wealthy corporations that pollute our streams need to be taxed more, um, then maybe that's what we need to do. Now, I know that's against uh, the, the orthodoxy um, uh, that exists in the legislature now, but we, I, I believe that, yeah, there, every legislative session, there's some improvement on some things. We need bigger jumps if we're going to catch up. Two minutes on that answer. You didn't bring up foster care once. Wow, well, I'll no. take that. Well, that's already, I already brought it up once, and uh, <laughs> I will bring it up again if you need me to. Well, you've got, <laughs> you're got you on deck next issue there, too. Mike Carl. I'm responding to his point. Right? Anything uh, you want. You can respond to him or to the original question. Well, the oh, I, I, uh, I, th- I think uh, there was a lot of progress made. There's still, I totally agree, a lot more to do. But I think there was a very significant. What did you regard as significant progress? Well, the, the the tax restructuring was was a step in the you know a big step in the right direction. It recognized a lot of, and the Senate version, you know, the one that passed was was superior because it it was both uh, it had a, a a trigger you know wait and see on on future not current but future increases in, in or, or reductions rather in the in the rates, but it also tied in. Uh, relief from the uh, personal property personal property tax uh, they, that was limited, and and I think ultimately we still need to do Amendment Two, but to have absolute you know clear language that requires a state you know replacement of the of the lost personal property tax revenues. But I think it was a you know a st- a, g- give, given the 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 horrible outcome of the the election and the amendments, I think it was a great step in the right direction admiral yeah i think there's some some credit should be uh given uh certainly the tax and i think the pia was right in the right direction i think the dhhr uh you took the simple approach just split in three different parts i'm not sure time will tell if that was the most productive way uh but it was <laughs> it was done i think some issues such as the correctional uh, was not addressed i think the fact that we uh, here into the political campaign will not increase the uh, uh, the spending at all is going to have long-term consequences. I think we're seeing on a lot of the infrastructure that we're we're seeing. I'm also uh, uh, concerned that toward the end we became in what I would consider some of the cultural warfare bills. Uh, spent a lot of time on it, and I think we as a state should look for our more pressing needs as opposed to get in the, these cultural questionable administration. Mr. Ferretti. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of a mixed bag with me. I think uh, kudos for addressing really important problems like PEIA, uh, reforming taxes, tax breaks, uh, and, and also the legislature funding the Economic Development Authority and Mitch Carmichael, who, who appear to be doing a, a very good job of attracting uh, businesses and jobs to the state. That, that's all good news, and, and the legislature deserves credit for that. I echo Bill's sentiments. I think some of the cultural uh, issues that the legislature seems inclined to uh, to tackle is not going to be a big welcome sign. Uh, if Mike Height wants to get people moving into West Virginia, uh, that that can be sometimes counterproductive. And and uh, but overall, I think the legislature has done a good job. But I, I think also uh, it, it bears watching going forward that. I, I've been dismayed at the lack of process. You know, as, as a lawyer, uh, and, and I'm sure the lawyers in the studio will agree with this, we're, we're, we're schooled on process. And it's not just Senator Carnes who is raising concerns about this. I saw other legislators very concerned about the suspension of rules, about not reading bills, about uh, deals basically being handled uh, in backroom uh, subcommittee meetings. And then being put on the floor and voted and rushed through right away, uh, there's been a lot of concern expressed about that. And and being uh, concerned about process, I hope that 
with one party rule, we won't forget how the legislative process is supposed to work and how public debate and how the receipt of evidence and expert testimony is still vital to the process. I, I just think that uh, we've kind of strayed from that a little bit. Mr. Height, comment on that? Well, I, yeah, I'll push back a little bit on that. The um, process was followed, and, and sometimes there – when you talk about these shortcuts to the process, well, that's part of process, too. The, the process allows for these particular shortcuts in certain instances, the suspension of rules in certain instances. So when, when you say process wasn't followed, I would say, yeah, it was, because the, the rules allow for these, these situations um, in certain instances. So um, – You'd have to be specific uh, about which ones you're talking about, and I could possibly tell you why things were done in the way they were. Um, but you know, Senator Carnes' issue was a a, uh, a small issue, in my opinion. It was handled the way it was handled, and that's the you know, let's move on from it. So, um, Senator Carnes sort of let it out of the bag what he was intending to do before he did it and the senate just stepped in and said no we're not going to allow this so i didn't have a problem with any of it joe anything come back on that well uh, i mean the proof's in the pudding uh, the senate passed out 23 bills on the first day of the session so was there a process um <laughs> i mean what kind of process does that allow for when you know th that many number of bills are, are passed out of, and we had the, the rare occurrence of a committee chairman uh, passing out his own bill out of committee uh, when he couldn't get it passed otherwise through a, a regular vote. So uh, this is just more than Senator Carnes expressing concerns about this. Others expressed concerns, too. And uh, I think there was some disappointment that was uh, raised by the fact that a lot of committee meetings and hearings were perfunctory. Uh, they did not involve testimony, gave members of the public 45 seconds to comment uh, on proposed legislation. It, it just seemed to me, in, in some respects now, did not all, but in some respects, uh, it seemed to be an ends uh, result type of uh, analysis being done by the legislature. And I understand this one party rule, they're going to get what they want uh, in the legislature, but still, uh, you know, the daylight is important when it comes to proposed legislation, and I hope that in the future we, we pay some respect to that. Well, the, the Senate pushed out a lot of those initial bills, and, and they did go through the process. They went through the process the year before. They came out of committee. Those are the ones that just never made it to the finish line, but they had already gone through the process. They had already been vetted. But there were newly elected senators there, yeah. there though, weren't there, Mike? There, there were, and, and, they had, and they had the opportunity to, to stand up on the floor and say something against those, but those, those bills were already vetted. They were just like overlap from last year. So I didn't have so much a problem with that. Um, as far as uh, Senator Trump uh, moving to discharge a bill from his own committee, I didn't have a problem with that either, that there in the rules there's, there's allowance for discharge. And I think what he felt was it got bottled up in committee um, and it didn't have the votes within committee because of all the discussions. And all he did was discharge it to the floor. The, they had to take a vote on the floor to approve his discharge motion, and they did. And then they voted on the bill itself, and it was approved on the floor. So it still went through the process of getting enough votes within the Senate to become law. So I, I didn't have a problem with it. Usually the discharge motions are a tool— uh, that the minority uses to try to get things out um, and to discuss them ad nauseum. Um, you don't see it a whole lot from the majority, but in cases like this, you did. I didn't see a problem with any of it. And uh, on that note, we take our break here. 2023, and for issue number four, we go to <coughs> Seamus McSchultz for his... Uh, Florida, his Florida now insists that schools... Uh, it's public schools should teach about Rosa Parks uh, without mentioning her race. And uh, this is a culture war, uh, Ron DeSantis thing that um, I, I fear if it were to pass and become 
uh, part of the curriculum in Florida. It may happen in other states. It's insanity. You cannot discuss the courage of Rosa Parks on that day in 1956 when she refused to leave a seat in the white section of the bus uh, to make room for white passengers so they wouldn't have to sit next to her. You can't possibly describe to our young women the guts that that took without saying, hey, there was a rule that said the black people and the white people couldn't sit in the same rows. And they're literally trying to do that in the state of Florida now with a governor who wants to run for president. Um, to me, we're, this, is, uh, this is something on the order of the sorts of things we hear about in, um, in communist countries and in other authoritarian countries where we're going to all ignore the obvious facts in the teaching of history. Um, not disputed facts, but obvious facts. It's not a dispute whether she was a person of color or not. And um, we can't talk about race. That's insane. It, it was such a big part of our country for so long, and we fought a civil war over it. I don't know how you're ever going to get history across the kids if you pass those kind of rules so your question to be my, answered? my question is what does everybody think about this uh, movement uh, on some segments of the republican party to uh, not say what it is all right let's go to billy first yeah, I think you have to look at this in context, uh, that uh, DeSantis is using this as a bully pulpit to try to chip away at, at Trump and because he's he's planning to run uh, run against Trump. So I think he's trying to become his bona fides, if you will, as as to to the right, to the right to the point that he's going to uh, get support of the of the more right side of the uh, the Republican base. Joe Ferretti. Yeah, I think this says more about Ron DeSantis than anything. And, and my expectation for Governor DeSantis' campaign for presidency, if it ever gets off the ground, uh, is that he, he's going to turn out to be a, a bit of an empty suit. Uh, he, he likes to take on Disney and, and uh, talk about masking in schools and things like that, which I understand is important for many residents in Florida, and, and they vote accordingly. But nationwide, uh, I don't know how he's going to play. I saw an interview of him when, when a reporter asked him about the uh, the war in Ukraine, and he didn't have an answer. Uh, hemmed and hawed, and basically he scolded the um, reporter for bringing up the issue. Uh, you know, <laughs> The guy's going to be a serious candidate for president. He better sharpen up and have more in his uh, holster than just uh, some of this cultural war stuff, which he seems to be inclined to uh, pursue and, and get headlines for. So I, I, I'm a wait and see guy on him, but I'm, I'm skeptical that he's going to be a big player uh, when he matches up against the Trump machine and, and the battles that are going to come and the attacks that are going to come. I, I'm just wondering if he's going to hold up. Mike Carl. Well, I, if 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 his position on this question is as described, I assume it is, and th then it's just a, a ridiculous overreaction to the, and, and just as bad as the sixteen nineteen system that has plagued our schools, and and it's ridiculous, and it 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 it, it uh, they really undermines the. Uh, legitimacy and the, and the validity of the point against 1619 uh, education uh, bias. Well, just a point of clarification, Larry, I thought the uh, race law was that you can't hold the white children in the school responsible for racism from however long ago uh, or even today when you're teaching uh, these subjects as opposed to you can't mention race at all. I, I don't understand that to be the crux of the law. Well, what's going on is school uh, textbook companies are actually changing. And just recently they released the historical lessons of Rosa Parks that doesn't mention 
the Montgomery bus boycott or the reason why Rosa Parks didn't want to leave her seat. And I just, it astonishes me in the 21st century in the United States of America where a simplest Google search will show you what it was about that we're not going to allow our children to hear this stuff. I never sat in a classroom, and I'd be happy to listen to anybody who did, who said, you little third graders, you're the ones who caused Rosa Parks all this pain. <laughs> I never heard of such a thing, and I don't think it's going on. That's Show me some evidence 1619 is, is going on, and that's what the message is. But this, 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 is, this makes it worse, this uh, uh, proposal that we're talking about. Mike, I so uh, I think it is going on, Larry. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not going on. I, I'm going to may be, see some it, evidence. It may not be happening in third grade, but it's, it's going on. I can assure you it's going on. However, you, you cannot teach about Rosa Parks without – talking about race that's that's the whole issue with rosa parks that you have to talk about race but i think this law doesn't say you can't talk about race you can t talk about race a a in its context in history and the race wars and all the things going on but what they're saying is you can't point at one group and say you're responsible for that and that is happening that is happening in schools, and I think sometimes it's being taken too far. Now, if a if a, a book manufacturer has taken that part out of the lesson plan, that's on the book manufacturer. That should have well, never the, been approved that's by the to, school system to to accept that book. But that's due to pressure from DeSantis. That's what I'm saying. They are making this available now because they don't want to lose. But there are also other books available customers. that don't do. This. So they, the school boards need to pick the the school book. The, the curriculum that teaches about race. You, you can't talk about Rosa Parks or a lot of these different issues without talking about race. Can't do it. You can't talk about the Holocaust without talking about Jews. There are certain things that, you know, as a nation, we have faults. We can talk about them. I don't have a problem with that. I don't think most people do. Back to you, Larry. Final thought? Um, I, I, I would be interested to see, and, and there's lots of people listening out there, who I'm sure can provide me with this, documented instances of teachers blaming little white kids for racism in America. Um, I, I've heard this said many times. I'm not seeing it. I, I, don't, um, I don't think they're sitting there. I don't, I don't think the issue is, as I've heard it and, and understand it from people who've related it, I don't think the issue is a teacher standing there saying to a, a third grader, you did this. I think what they're basically saying is your race as a white person committed this atrocity and you are equally as responsible for it because that is your race. I think that's the issue that's being brought up as a concern to curb that sort of um, education in the classroom. They, 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 what they're trying to do is deny the virtue of the white people some of the white people in America who stood up and worked with African Americans and ended slavery and ended discrimination uh, allowed by government. That's what they're trying to, they're just trying to deny the effect of that. So the 1619 Project, in your view, is something that denies that white people helped overthrow slavery? Yes. Huh. Absolutely. I would love hey, how to about see 1776? any curriculum. How, how about 1865? School? You know, how 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 about the Civil Rights Act? Show me a curriculum in any school. That's all I'm asking. They keep saying this, but I don't want to hear some boogeyman story about Florida. I want to see the book and the the teacher's syllabus that says today's the day these white kids pay. <laughs> I, I, it just doesn't make well. It doesn't make no, any no, sense. No, no, no. I, I, I agree it's not that overt or extreme, but, but, but by denying <laughs> the virtue of some of the part of the white population over these many levels, you know, the, 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 the Civil War, the end of slavery, the uh, Civil Rights Act, led by white Republicans, I will emphasize, <laughs> and opposed by white Democrats, Right up until Nixon flipped that around. Yeah, I got it. 
You don't want to take on Nixon. He was in his White House. <laughs> no, 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 Carl was in his White House. Yeah, 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 yeah. Make a case. When, when, you know, we don't have time for that. No, yeah. we don't. Good, Bill. Looked like you had something there. No, 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 no. I'm just enjoying the exchange. All right, then we move on to issue number five, and for that, we go to Michael O'Carroll. Uh, you, we took my real issue, the tax reform, but, but uh, just keep it at the state level. What do we make of uh, the? In the you know, reports we get that, that uh, Justice is trying to sell his coal business. Uh, my thought is, that it is cynical, admittedly, mm-hmm. uh, that, that, that it is to not only uh, get rid of an embarrassing uh, part of his image, which is that he doesn't pay his bills uh, in the millions and tens of millions of dollars, but, uh, but is also... Uh, 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 you know, eliminate some hassles that even he occasionally has to deal with, uh, even though he's he's a very poor manager. The the and and it, and and so you know, and that hope you know, or at least presumably frees him up to be a little more attractive candidate for higher office. So my thought is that who 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 sees it that Did way? Did he sell the coal mine so he can run for senate? Yeah, is that your point? That, that that's the succinct point. All right, Joe Ferretti. I'm here. I, I speak Carly's and Stubblefieldies, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Bilingual. Yes, absolutely. And they're equally yeah. important. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that um, he is clearing the decks for a run. Uh, I, I have no doubt that he is probably has some internal polling that shows he is widely popular in the state. And would beat Manchin head to head. I think uh, his biggest battle might be in the primary, as it's going to be with most Republicans uh, running for office in this state. Uh, and I think he'll uh, he'll beat Mooney rather easily too. So uh, if he starts to hear all those accolades, uh, given the, the big ego that Big Jim has, I, I can't see him resisting the in, the uh, desire to run for a U.S. Senate seat. So I think it's happening. Larry Schultz. Um, it could be that. It could be simply that he uh, has taken a look at the calendar and counted his own birthdays and said, you know, maybe it's time for me to just ease off into the sunset and retire. Um, he'll still be always able to get a crowd um, because all he's got to do is bring his dog out there, right? Um, he'll still be able to – he'll be able to – uh, involve himself in these campaigns. I cannot believe I'm gonna I'm gonna really be shocked if he actually launches a full blown Senate campaign, because you know that's a lot of hours and a lot of time. That's a lot of miles that guy carrying the stool is gonna have to carry it up to the <laughs> microphone for. Him. Uh, and you know with the shortages we have elsewhere in government employment, uh, you'd think that guy might be looking for new work. Uh, so, <laughs> I just think he's going to retire. <laughs> Bill. Yeah. <laughs> going back to Mike's uh, uh, original question, uh, I think uh, Justice sees this as a campaign issue. He's been very quick to clarify, at least point out, uh, he's doing this to be fair to his creditors and to his family. And it's not a campaign issue at all. But then flipping the coin he's putting his son as the as a fall guy if this material if it, if it goes south it's going to be the son that made the mistake and not justice i think this is strictly a political ploy on his part mr height um i think mike's absolutely right he's clearing the deck to run for a senate seat um and uh, Larry, if, if you think this guy is going to retire and, and <laughs> sail off into the sunset, you are mistaken. There is nobody that loves Jim Justice like Jim Justice. Um, and I think he he loves the spotlight. And a Senate seat is, is like the ultimate for him right now. And I think he has every intention to run for Senate. Um and I don't know that I would count Mooney out because every time I've counted Mooney out, he's won handily. Um, this will come down uh, to a race between uh, Lala and Baby Dog 
to see who can get the most votes. Um, <laughs> and you're putting Lala in the same category as Baby Doll? No, no, not at all. Absolutely. But um, they're both popular. They're I, both they're very both popular. Right. Yeah. They're, they are both more popular than the, the ones that they're representing. Um, and I, not that Jim Justice isn't popular, but Baby Dog's much more popular. Um, and, and and while Alex seems to be popular, uh, especially in the upper part of the state, uh, Lala is more popular. Um, so it, it'll be an interesting race, no doubt about it. Um, but I, I fully expect Jim Justice to get into the race for senator. And yeah. that's why he's, he's getting rid of it.